invite you now to join us for a time of quiet prayer and meditation as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Helps in the name of the Lord who created heaven and earth. Amen. We want to welcome each one of you this morning as we gather to worship Christ our King. A few announcements. Next Sunday we will start our special services. The Reverend James McManus. Some of you know him uh, from youth camp and youth retreats. Uh, he will be our speaker. He is from the Bethel ARP Church and he has some connection to Lancaster. I don't know. McManus, McManus or something. Anyway, he can explain that to you. But James will be here uh, Sunday morning and then 6.30 each night, Sunday through Wednesday. We will be having a spaghetti lunch uh, dinner, free lunch, uh, after church next week, taking up donations for Appalachia. And then we'll also be normal, having our normal Wednesday night meal, okay? So please make a note of those announcements in the bulletin. Encourage you to come out each night and also invite your friends. Um, we do have a diaconate meeting tonight at 7, and we also have a thank you note from Miss Mariella if you would look at it on the office uh, bulletin board. Please make a note of the other announcements in your bulletin, and let's prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord. Stand for the call to worship. The call to worship comes from Psalm 147 1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. It is pleasant and fitting to sing praises to God. With that in mind, let us turn in our Red Trinity hymnal and sing number 30. 
Our God, our help in ages past, number three zero. O oh God in heaven, you are our help in ages past. And that experience that you have given your people of you being their help, it helps us in the present to know that we are not alone, that no matter what we face, you are with us, and that you will be with us as we go through this life. Father, you do not call us to a blind faith, but that you show us by your power, by your love, by the example of Christ, by your holy example with your people through scripture from the beginning of time, that you can be trusted and that you are a real and true help to us, your people. Father, we come and we praise you that your word is true as you are true. We come and we praise you that your word instructs us and teaches us. And is based upon who you are as a perfect, almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing God. Father, open our eyes and open our hearts and draw us closer to you as a God that we might know you, that we might experience you, that we might understand more and more who you've revealed yourself to be in your word, <coughs> that we might glorify you and enjoy you with all that we have. Father, we come this morning and we acknowledge you to be the one true and living God. We adore you for who you are as that perfect, merciful, loving, and just God. <coughs> Father, we come, though, as, as we come into the light of who you are, as we come and see that you are a God who has been our help in ages past. Father, we know our weakness. We know the failing of our strength. We know our love for sin. We know the battle that we each fight. And we know the losses that we have endured. And so we come, even as a redeemed people, even being white as snow through the blood of Christ, we still come and confess our sin. We confess not only our tendency to sin, but we come and confess that we are actual sinners, that we blow it, that we don't do the things we know we should do while doing the things we know we should not do. And yet you tell us if we come that you will forgive us, that we are forgiven in Christ. So we open up our hearts this morning and we cry out for forgiveness 
for healing and for strength to fight on. Father, we come into worship and we acknowledge who we are and who you are. And now we worship you knowing these things as we come and we use the words of Christ as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand, please. Father in heaven, we come now and we give our tithes and offerings to, in worship of you and obedience to you. Bless our church and give us what we need to do the ministry that you've called us to do. And may we give with a cheerful heart, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
This morning we come and we confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Why do we do this? We do this to remind each other what we believe in a world of unbelief, in a world where churches are denying what we are about to confess. One of my professors in seminary said back when the mid-80s, he was talking to one of his denominational executives, and this fellow said, well, I believe what you believe. And he said, do you believe in the virgin birth? Well, no. Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Well, no. It can be, be very much in today's age that we are like Elijah, and we wonder, are we alone? And we need to remember there are those who have not bowed the knee to Baal. How do we do this? Part of the way we do this is by confessing this faith, the Apostles' Creed, in our weekly worship. So with that in mind, Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you take your blue ARP Psalter, we're going to sing one of the old Bible song selections in the back, um, Under His Wings, uh, which is a version of Psalm 91 and a famous Bible song. So let us stand and sing. 183.
may be seated. Our scripture reading from the Old Testament today as we continue through 1 Samuel 17. It's 1 Samuel 17, 24 through 30. That can be found in your pew Bibles on page 240. 1 Samuel 17, beginning with verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. This is Goliath they're talking about. Fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Elab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Elab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? But he turned away from him towards another. And spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. The reading of God's word. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as your people, gathered here today, gathered in of, of young and old, of women and men, of all sorts of people. And yet we come through one Christ. We come through the one power of the Holy Spirit. And our prayers leave this room and they combine together and our hearts are united together by the Spirit as He carries our prayers to the very throne of God where we know our God hears and our God answers. And we are thankful for such a privilege to be able to come into your presence and to pray to you, to talk to you as a people of God gathered on the Lord's day. Father, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you that you have opened our eyes, that we might see your scripture, that we might see the fullness of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done, the hope that is ours through his death and resurrection. We praise you that you give it freely to us. It is imputed to us freely in its fullness. We are not left working a list of things that we must check off, of things that we must do to be saved. We are given fully Christ the moment we have faith. And we are considered beloved children, sons and daughters. We do not have to fast to be saved. We do not have to go through rites to be saved. We simply must believe and cry upon the name of Christ. Repent. And then we are saved. And for that we come with praise and thanksgiving that the burden of the law has been removed from us so that we now worship in security. We now worship as family. We worship as children of the living God. Father, we praise you for that assurance of salvation. We praise you for that closeness of the relationship that is ours. Father, we come... And we thank you that you really are our help in ages past, our hope for tomorrow. 
Father, we come and we lift up our prayers for the sick in our church. We th are thankful for many answered prayers for those who are back with us, those who are almost back with us. We thank you for those who've had surgery and those who've recovered from surgery. Father, be with those who have injuries that they're dealing with. Father, we call upon you knowing you are the great physician, you are the great healer, and you do that either by your, your miraculous power or you do it through medicines and surgeries and, and other means of men. But in any case, we lift up those we know to be sick, those to be struggling physically, those who are ill. Father, we put them in your hands. And we pray for you to work your work and to bring healing, and to bring comfort, to bring a freedom from pain. Father, we come We come and pray for those with mental illness. We think of one in particular. And we pray as he meets with the presbytery tomorrow that you would work through the power of your word and your spirit by the love of brothers that you might work miraculous things in our sight and bring healing to a dear friend and a dear brother who is struggling mentally. <coughs> Father, we pray for his family that has all but been destroyed because of this mental break. Father, you are our help, and we need you to be our help. Father, we come and we pray for those with emotional issues. We pray for those who have struggles at work, those who have struggles within their family, those who just need your grace and your peace and your comfort. Pour it out upon them, Father. Father, we come and we pray for our police officers. We pray for our civil government. We pray especially for our police officers who do a, a thankless job to protect us and care for us. And Father, we pray that you would uplift them and uphold them and, most importantly, protect them. Father, we come and we pray for our church. We pray, Father, for the session as we and the diaconate as we are working to improve the way we do ministry, starting with us as leaders, reaching out to the, to the congregation, trying to be shepherds. Father, help us as continue in that passage. Help us to see the importance of of people and reaching out to them and father we pray you would bless us as a church bless us with the money that we need to operate this church bless us with the people and the gifts in the people that we might do the ministry that you've called us to do father may we be bold in our ministry we are not living in a day where we need to be timid, but we are living in a day where we need to have a boldness for Christ, not an ugliness, not a, not a, a meanness, but a boldness to reach out into our world here in Lancaster, to our homes and beyond. Father, give us that spirit of boldness. Father, we pray for programs of our church. We pray especially for these special services that are coming up. We pray for James McManus and we pray for him, Father, that you would fill him with your spirit, help him to prepare messages that proclaim Christ and exposit your word. That we would be, that the saints would be fed and would grow and that the lost might hear and believe and be saved. Father, we come and we lift each other up in prayer. We thank you for our church family. And we thank you. And we pray that you would draw us closer together through Sunday school and through Wednesday nights and through other opportunities to serve you together. Bless us and draw us together and make us one that we might serve and bless you. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The choir can be dismissed. The children, if you would come down. The congregation turn to Acts 2, 14 through 18.
Good morning. Y'all did a very good job singing, as always. I have a question for you this morning. I have two things here. What are they? Bible. This is a Bible? Does your Bible have ships on it? What is this? That's a book, and this is the Bible. Now, there's a difference between a book and the Bible, right? You know, that's one of my pet peeves, and it's not a big deal. If you, if you were to answer, if you were to say that the Bible is your favorite book, I'm not going to get on you too much. Only to say this, the Bible's not a book, right? Now, this is a book. This is a great book. It's called Six Frigates, The Epic History of the Founding of the U.S. Navy. Now, I'll let y'all borrow that if you'd like. It's not an old book either. It's fairly new. What, Sydney wants to read it? Oh, you can read it. It's, only, it's, it's pretty short, too. It's only got 400 pages. And then 100 pages of notes. It, it's a good book. But this is the Bible. This tells the story of U.S. Navy. It's written by, I believe, a lawyer out in San Francisco who does that as a hobby. And it's an excellent book about the history of the U.S. Navy, if you're interested in this thing. This, though, who is the ultimate author of this? God. That's right. Give me a, come give me a fist bump on that. I like Philip. Right or wrong, Philip's going to be enthusiastic about his answer, and I like that. But he's right on this one. It is God who wrote this, right? Now, he used different men, right? He used, who are some of the men that wrote the Bible? Paul and John. Paul wrote a huge part of it. What about the Old Testament? There's one guy who wrote a large portion of it. Oh, you know the New Testament? Who, sto- who wrote the story of Isaac? Genesis, Exodus. Who wrote those stories? Let me give you a hint. He was found in a basket in the reeds. Moses wrote it, right? Now, Moses wrote it, but who's the ultimate author? God. We can talk about that some other time when we have more time. That's a longer story. But remember, it's important to read good books, right? Some of you might read fiction. That's fine, too. I'm not much on fiction. I like to read stuff like this, right? But never let it sacrifice for this, because this is the living word of God, and it takes you to God, and it shows you God, and it shows you the gospel, and God uses it. God uses it to teach us and grow us. This is where we look for God, right? What you got? Really? We'll talk about that more later, okay? Let me pray for you, okay? Father in heaven, I thank you for these children. I thank you for their enthusiasm, and I thank you for the fact they know that your Bible, the Bible is your word. And we pray that that word would be read through the years, that they might be useful in your kingdom and be blessed. Father, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Good job. Good job. We're at Acts 2, but as you can hear those sirens, why don't we talk a moment and just pray for wherever those sirens are going. Father in heaven, we pray, Father, as we hear our EMS and our fire department moving to some situation, we just pause as your people, and we pray not knowing what that situation is, but praying that you would use your power and your spirit to help whoever's in need to protect those who are going to help that need. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We're back in Acts, Acts chapter 2. We'll begin reading at verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, let's hear God's word. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give ear to my word, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servant and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. What causes people to believe in Jesus? What caused you to believe in Jesus? Now, we, you know, we, we dance around that every Sunday, but do we ever just hit that directly? What causes you or what causes people in general to believe in Jesus? It's important to know that answer. Is it our passionate pleas? Do we need to sing just as I am nine times? There's four verses, right? Do we have to sing it nine times in an effort to break through? Is it our lives in themselves? Do we just have to look holy and act holy and be Christians? And that alone will bring people to know Jesus. Is it our emotional plea? Does Pastor Kyle need to cry more when he preaches? No. And let me be quick to say, there's nothing wrong with a passionate plea, but we ain't singing nine verses to just as I am at the end of the service. And we, our lives should reflect the gospel. We should reflect what the gospel and the spirit does in a human life, and we should shine for Jesus. And there's not a... There's nothing wrong with pleading with the emotions even, if done correctly. But what is our end goal in reaching out with the gospel? What are we trying to do? Are we simply trying to push somebody over a line to get them to say the right words, to pray a little prayer, and be done? I hope not. Because what we should be trying to get them to do is to accept Jesus, to profess faith in Jesus, and then live out a life for Jesus for the rest of their life. That's what the Great Commission talks about, right? We are to make disciples, people who are going to follow Jesus all their life, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our passage, really the whole of Acts 2, we see the answer to this question. What causes people to believe in Jesus? Peter's preaching a sermon. He does a couple of things. First, we see the role of the Holy Spirit. Second, we see that he preaches Christ. And third, we see that he expounds the Word of God. So let's look at our passage here. What has happened to Peter? Go back just a few weeks, and where is Peter? You remember where Peter was? We're right there at the point where Jesus is about to be betrayed. He's being led off. He almost to that point. And Peter says, I'm not going to leave you. And Jesus says, yes, you are. Before the rooster crows three times. And we know that Peter does exactly what Jesus said. That three times... Peter denies Christ at that crucial moment. He cannot stand with Christ. But now we see, just a few weeks later, Peter is standing and leading the other 11 apostles. Peter, a simple, uneducated fisherman, now preaches a strong and powerful sermon. How can that be? Did he take some type of correspondence course, online course. Maybe he got the book Preaching for Dummies and read it over this time. Do you think that's what it was? Do you think he got a self-help book? What, what changed in Peter? Well, it's simple. We just saw it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Having been restored by Jesus after the resurrection, now Peter, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, stands up to speak. And when he speaks, what does he do? Charles Erdman says he preaches Christ. 
and he expounds scripture. In our day, we see people claim to have special revelation. We'll see it all the time, or direct revelation. A great famous example of this is Oral Roberts. Now, I have some affinity for Oral Roberts. I grew up much of my childhood when I was at my grandparents. We would watch Oral Roberts. I think it was more for the singing. I hope it was. But, um, but I do have some love for Oral Roberts. But this is a little bit on the odd side. In January of 1987, he came out and said if he didn't raise $8 million by March, God would call him home, January 1987. At the end of March, he was $4.5 million short. He died in 2009. You be the judge. Did he have a direct revelation? No. Now note, well, that's not how the Spirit works. But how does the Spirit work? It's to proclaim Christ. And it works in and through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. That's simply what the Spirit's doing. It's working in our hearts to apply the Word, to apply Christ. The Holy Spirit is not your personal fortune teller. He has come to empower the Christian life, applying the works of Christ to you, imparting, imputing to you, Christ benefits. Now that word imputing is very important in theology. It imputes. Usually we use it, I always say this, we, when do we use the word impute? We, we say you're imputing a motive, right? You're giving a motive to one, an action. Usually that's not a good thing either. But here in theology when you impute something, you give it fully. So that when we say Christ and his work and his goodness and all of Christ's things he's done for us are imputed to us. They're given to us completely. They're not infused. We don't eat Jesus to try to get a little more Jesus in us. We don't baptize to have a little bit of Jesus come to us. We don't do works to gain Jesus to us. It's given to us at faith. And that's important. And the Holy Spirit gives this imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. This is why God can't love you more than he loves you right now, Christian. Because he doesn't love you based on how good you are. He loves you because he freely loved you and gave you Christ, and he loves you. And see, the Holy Spirit, part of its job is to open, his job is to open our eyes to the Bible. So that when we take the Bible, and these little children say, yes, that's God's word. For that to be true in their hearts, the Holy Spirit is working within their mind, in their heart and soul, to say, that's God's word. Believe it. The Holy Spirit tells us that it is true. He works to help us to understand it. In James 1, 5, we read, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives it without reproach, and it will be given to him. How do we get wisdom from the Bible? The Holy Spirit opens our mind, helps us to understand, helps us to connect the dots, helps us to bring our lives into the Word so that God's Word speaks to where we are today. The Holy Spirit brings to mind Scripture when we need it. We can go back to Matthew. This is before the Holy Spirit goes out, but the same point, Matthew 10, 19 through 20. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you're to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not, for you, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Maybe you've had that experience. I have. Walk into a, a buzz saw of a theological debate when you didn't even mean to get into it. And the next thing you know, you're quoting scripture. Scripture you hadn't thought about months or years. How's that happen? Holy Spirit. <coughs> Holy Spirit working in us and helping us. We see in Peter a man full of the Spirit. 
We see the power of the Holy Spirit in what Peter does, and we see the end result of the Spirit's work, which is at the end of Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people are saved in one day. Next, we see that Peter is responding to the mockers. Now, understand here, Peter is not what we would call today triggered. Y'all familiar with that? The term triggered? You young people are probably, right? Triggered is when somebody does something and you now are all upset about it, right? If somebody, uh, I'll give you some, probably some more neutral examples of this. There's some non-neutrals that we'll try to avoid. If someone says something about your favorite football team and you're a zealous fan, you might get triggered in defense of that. You know, if someone says something about your precious child, you might get triggered. Okay, are we following ourselves here? Okay. Peter is not triggered in the fact. He's not upset in the fact. He's not angry, or as my friend Clint Davis has said, he's not fired up over the fact they've called him drunk. But he engages in a more playful or jest, uh, jesting banter, as Gordon Ketty says in his commentary. The mockers are saying that they are filled with new wine. This is a nice way of saying they're drunk as skunks. Now they've been drawn, these mockers, like everyone else, have been drawn to this scene. There's the, the rushing like wind sound that's coming. Uh, there's just, the spirit has come upon them. This is, let's just be honest, it's quite a spectacle. Make no doubt about it. Now these folks who are not believers, they come and they have to have an answer. Why are the people at first ARP jumping around and speaking in tongues and doing all this stuff, right? They've got to answer it. They can't just walk away from it. They've got to have some answer in their mind, and the best thing they can come up with, they drunk. They've been hitting the communion wine. It's easy to do that, isn't it? When you can't understand something, cast some type of blame. Today, there are many who can't understand Christianity. There are many who come out and say, well, why do y'all follow that old book? Why do y'all believe in this guy that walked around 2,000 years? Why do y'all follow a mean God? And they use illustrations from the Old Testament. Why do you own and own and own? And maybe you are like this here today. Maybe you can't understand it why people make Christ Lord. Maybe you can't understand why people follow the Bible. Maybe you can't understand why they declare His truth. For you, if that is you, if you're like the mockers, if you don't understand it, if you can't grasp it, if you, and I don't know why you're here, but the Lord led you here. And if you're here, for you, I ask you to do this. Pray to God to open your eyes. Go back to James. Pray that the Lord would give you wisdom to see, eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe. Ask that, and then read the Bible, seeking God. And see if God would not give you wisdom. And see if God and His Spirit would not open your heart to the truth of the gospel. Hear now Peter's response to the mockers. He cries out to all men, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. He says, let this be known to you. Give ears to my word. And know what he does first. He gives a logical argument to address the drunk thing. Look what he says. For these people are not drunk as you suppose. This is only the third hour of the day. Translation. These people can't be drunk. It's only 9 a.m. And note that he starts in the world. But then he moves on. And he goes to the scripture. John Stott is a famous Anglican. Preached in London. Died not but a few years ago. Wrote a book on preaching called Between Two Worlds. The title alone hits it square in the head. When we preach, we as Christians, we have two worlds that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the world here. 
the world of Lancaster, the world of the United States, the world. The world that we see the mockers in. The world that we see Peter address. But then we have the other world, the world of the scripture, the world of the Christians, the world of God and the spirit. That now Peter moves on to. Preaching needs to be in both worlds. Our ministry needs to be in both worlds. Your life needs to be in both worlds. Both in the world of unbelief, addressing their issues, talking and speaking and loving those who do not believe, yet at the same time drawing them into the world of the scriptures, the world of Christ. Finally, we see prophecy fulfilled from Joel. God promised in the last days to pour out his spirit on all people. And this is what they are seeing, the fulfillment of God's word and promises. Now, this begs the debate, when are the last days? And there's some disagreement on the exact date. There's some who would argue Christ's birth, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, Christ's ascension. To me, it's simple. I think it's Christ's ascension. Remember, as Christ ascended, and the, they're all sitting there looking up. The two angels come and say, why are y'all looking up? Go get busy. He's coming back the same way he went up. The last days are the days in which we look for the, the second coming of Christ. We're in those last days now, and we have been since Christ ascended. We are given the great commission. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit. All Christians have the Holy Spirit. Note Joel's words from the Old Testament and note the fulfillment of this now in our world. He says, he will pour out my spirit on all people. And then look at the list of people named. On sons and daughters, young and old men, male and female servants. All people. The Holy Spirit is not just given to a limited number. It's not just to a few, to a few prophets, priests, or kings, like in the Old Testament. He is giving it to all who believe. It is giving it to you, Christians. Protestants believe in what we call the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther wrote in his commentary on Peter and Jude. This word priest should become as common as the word Christian. He said that because all Christians are priests. We all have the Holy Spirit. You have equal access to God. Think about that. You have access to God. By the Holy Spirit. You don't have to come to Kyle. You don't have to write your prayers out and say, Kyle, pray for me on this. Now, that's fine. I, I do pray for you and I want to do that. But understand, you don't have to do that, right? Do you understand how freeing that is? I'm, I'm talking about for me. I don't want to have to pray all your prayers, right? How freeing it is for you, though, that you don't have to get out of your bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can pray. You don't have to leave work. You can just simply bow your prayer head at your desk and, or just find a moment, and you can pray, and God hears you just as well as he hears me. You don't have to come to this sanctuary. The sanctuary is beautiful. I come in here and pray sometimes. But praying in the sanctuary isn't going to make you any closer to God. Because God has come close to you in the Holy Spirit so that when you pray, he hears it. Not because you go through me or you go to a certain place. Because he's poured out his Holy Spirit on all people. And this makes your prayers just as important. Your prayers, wherever you pray them and whenever you pray them, are just as important as my prayers or Billy Graham's prayers or the Apostle Peter's prayers. Because we believe in a priesthood of all believers. And God hears your prayers equally because of it. So is your ministry just as important. 
they teach us in seminary, they say, talk about our ministry as pastors. But really, our ministry as pastors is to help you with your ministry. Because you're a priesthood of all believers. You are priests. You have a ministry. Each of us in the church is gifted by the Holy Spirit. Each of us, the Holy Spirit is working gifts in us, working the fruit in us, right? There's one fruit, nine aspects of it, and that's being worked in our lives. That's each of You can't opt out of that. You can't say, well, I don't have patience. No, you've got to deal with that. I don't have kindness. No, you've got to deal with that. Why? Because that is what God is doing in your life to create in you that fruit. But for each of us, he gives gifts. And this is where the difference comes in. To some of us, we teach. We preach. Others have a, a spirit or a gift of discernment. Some have a gift of giving. Some have a gift of helping. Some have a gift of encouragement. They're, they're Barnabases, right? Some have a gift of evangelism. I think Leon Brown, our buddy, he has a gift for evangelism. On and on, there are different gifts. And the neat thing to think about it is, as I sit in my office and think, what are we going to do with the church? God has given us gifts to accomplish what he wants us to do. How do I know that? He has poured out the Holy Spirit on all flesh, on all you Christian, that we might do our ministry, that you might do your ministry. There's real power for you to minister for God by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that, in that mind, let me ask this question to you, church. What is the church to you? What is its purpose? Is it a lifeboat or an escape capsule so that you just sort of come in the walls of the church, you come in the church family, and we try to sit here together and escape the world to survive until Jesus comes back? Sometimes I wonder if that's not our attitude. It should not be. We should be like John Stott says. We should be between two worlds. We should be in our world here. We should be for Christ. We should be about Christ. But we should also be out in the world using our gifts, using our stuff that God has given us for ministry that we might bless the world and do his will. For the church is a powerful force to change the world by the gospel, by the word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit which is given to all of us. Why we are to be like a city on a hill or a lamp on a stand. The church is to be light that draws people in. How can we do that? We can't do it. I mean, we can. We can. We can use worldly means. But if we use worldly means, if we use worldly tactics, they're going to come in, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to leave because those will not hold a church together. The only thing that can hold a church together is the Holy Spirit. A commitment to the word. And each of us doing our ministry based on that. Word and gifting of the spirit. You see, we're called as a church to engage the world. Think about it for a minute. How is First ARB Church Lancaster going to engage the world? We can engage each other. But where are we going to have a point of contact with the world? This Bible keeps looking up on me. I don't know what in the world is driving me crazy. But where are we going to engage the world? Where do we do it? We can't stay in these walls, can we, and engage the world? I think the first step we can, maybe. You know, I don't know why the Lord has brought us a large number of kids from the neighborhood. I mean, I really am just sort of lost at this. But he's brought them for some reason, right? God knows what he's doing. Well, here's a point where we can engage the world. And we're going to have to engage the world. And it's not by our wisdom. It's not by our being funny or being able to relate. Think about how different those kids that come on Wednesday night are. They come from a different race, most of them. A different class a different background, a different culture. I think about some of our older saints, we'll just call the elders out here. You know, I think about the elders, the music the elders listen to and the movies the elders watch. 
and then I listen to those kids and know what music they listen to and what movies they watch. I'm not thinking they're the same. Where do we connect? Maybe basketball, but what a weak connection. What do we do? Well, I think we do the same thing we see Peter does here. How do we reach out? The same way Peter does. First, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we love those kids and anybody else that we can minister to who will give us access to their life. We love them. We engage them. We build real relationships with them. And through that real relationship, we proclaim Christ to them. We teach them God's word. And in doing that, we trust God to do the work he's promised to do. How can we reach the lost outside of our walls? How do we reach people my age and younger that have not been to church all their lives? People who don't understand Christianity, who think we're a bunch of stuffy old people. How are we going to reach past those things? Proclaim Christ. Teach the word. Trust God by his Holy Spirit. We must trust God using the gifts given to us. And then see what God will do among us. We have seen God do great things. Trust God now and let's see what great things he might do. Church, are you willing to trust God? Session, are you willing to trust God? Diaconate, are you willing to trust God? Preacher, are you willing to trust God? This is a step of faith. To see what God can do through us, through you. He's poured out his Holy Spirit upon you. He's given us a guide and direction of proclaiming Christ and expounding the word. Will we do this? Will you do this? Or will we just sit? Will we just sit like we're in a lifeboat waiting on Jesus to come up? The choice is yours, church. Will we step out trusting God who has given us his Holy Spirit or we'll sit back going woe is us what will happen to our church you know what we need to do let's do it let's pray Heavenly Father Lord we come today we come today and you have given us a charge as you have throughout your word you have told us what we should do Father I pray you would help the leaders to lead in this direction. Father, I pray that you would help the congregation to push the leaders in this direction, not that they need it. But Father, may we all go together in this same direction. May we trust in you. May we not look for tricks or for programs, but may we see the power of the Spirit at work within this congregation, within the families and lives of the individuals. May you work to produce fruit, the fruit of your Spirit. May you show the gifts you've given, and may we use them together to proclaim Christ, to exposit the Word. And Father, as we do that, draw people to yourself. Bring salvation. Fulfill your word. We long to see that in our day. May we be a city upon a hill, a light upon a stand. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we come and sing a hymn of response. Is O God beyond all praising, 660.
Today you've heard the gospel. You've been challenged. If you don't see it, see it now. Ask God to give you eyes to see and a heart to believe. Ask him to open your eyes to his word as you read it, that you might see who Christ is and what he has done and believe on him. Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.